Hello, everybody, and welcome back to That Milan Podcast. Martino Puccio, Matt Santangelo alongside you guys. We just had a little bit of a malfunction prior to this, so that's why you kind of see the graphics all over the place. But again, thank you guys so much for tuning in and joining us. Subscribe, like, and comment uh, your thoughts on Milan recently and how well they have played. Um, obviously, we're going to get into a bunch of stuff, uh, mainly starting with the Lecce match. But Matt, um, we looked fantastic. And, and I mean by our predictions. Once again, for the second straight week, Milan defeated Fiorentina 2-1. to one. UI and Kush all had that prediction. And then we said right at the end of the last podcast, how about Captain America in the number 10 position against um, <clears throat> our opponents in Lecce? And to just have the basic immediate impact within the six minute was great to see. We'll get into how Chukweze played so well, but everybody in the attacking uh, formation got a goal contribution in this match. But talk about Pulisic and basically his overall ability and how he's able to just be this versatile in three different positions virtually. Man, I mean, he looked very, very comfortable. And I think, you know, those who watch the men's national team, U.S. men's national team, that is, um, they know that he's a player that can play in this role. He could do it well. He can, you know, be that sort of key cog. Um, and sometimes it can be difficult to be that key cog when you do have Rafael Leao on the left side who – you know, is our number 10 um, number wise, and he is our main attacker. So, you know, he does command a lot of the attention. He does command a lot of the ball and he does have a lot of responsibility, but we've seen through, through this entire season, Martino, um, that, you know, these two players can coexist despite all these sort of fabricated and, you know, these made up theories that, you know, they don't like each other and they, mm. they, they don't have, they have an issue. And there was that, that, that problem with that one goal in the Europa league, these players do have a real good harmony going and they do look really strong when they do play. And now we have gotten that glimpse to see him play as a number 10 within this system. You know, it's, it's always important to stress that because we've seen players play as a, you know, a number 10 or a winger or, you know, a false nine for the national team. And it, for whatever reason it works, but then they try to play that same role for their club. And for whatever reason, it's just not the same impact. So the fact that we were able to see Pulisic get the number 10, um, uh, role in this game and score a phenomenal goal on his left foot. I mean, the buildup to that goal was fantastic. And, you know, you saw Chukweze, which we'll talk about, you know, skate pressure, be very direct, dribble by a couple players, and then put it on his left foot and put it right onto Pulisic. And from that point forward, he scored a phenomenal goal with his left foot, a goal that was very similar to the one he scored against Monza um, in losing fashion the game 4-2, yeah. um, which – I tried to put together in post, but I don't want to get copyrighted. So um, you guys can use your imagination, go back to the highlights, and you'll know which one I'm talking yeah. about. But to put that on the left foot and to really launch that at home, um, like the fans, man, I think the fans are – you're starting to see like a lot of more signs of Pulisic, a lot more Pulisic yeah. jerseys. I mean, Martino, like before we go into other players and dive in, into other topics, could you have imagined anything more – from this transfer than this. I mean, the commercial success, nice. it, yeah. the, 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 the Italian Milanisti really embracing this whole American dynamic and Pulisic, and then you're the goal production, right? Like it's one thing that you know, to score and to, to do all that, but commercially too, that we know is very important and prominent in the sport today. I mean, it's been a slam dunk, can't miss deal from the onset. And this is, you know, a player that now reportedly Milan are looking to extend until 2028, according to Antonio Vitiello. So, I mean, this yeah. has been a, in many, many eyes, the, the signing of the summer for a lot of clubs. People could say Marcus Turan, they could say a couple of the players. Mm. By the week, Pulisic is really making his case. I think that was his 10th league goal and his six. Yeah, I'll get into those going. stats right now if you really want yeah. to. So for the for, for example here, right, we're highlighting his Chelsea career. His first season was fantastic. 11 goals, 7 assists in all competitions. It was really strong for them. But if you go over the last three seasons, he had 15 goals in all competitions in every single season combined. This year, he has 14 in all competitions for me. So to put that into perspective, and the same can go for the assists. He had 10 assists over those three years as well. He has eight this season for Milan. Um, again, I think just the overall health was the main concern for many people. But just in general on how he's been able to just provide this spark, you don't need to be a, an elite athlete in Serie A. You just need to be an above average one. Pulisic is that. I think he's an above average technical player. That's honestly the thing that everybody likes to highlight. Yeah, well, well, this and that about the athleticism. Well, to be honest, guys of his size and stature aren't always the greatest of athletes, and that's okay. You don't need to be that when you have this sort of technical ability. Again, naturalized right foot. 
primarily a left winger for for the U.S. men's national team, as we all know. But mm. once again, we're seeing a guy who is scoring consistently on his left foot. Uh, you highlight the goal against Monza. He had goals against Slavia Prague, uh, even against Ren as well. Like he's just always finding a way to be involved. I thought his buildup was great with this. And again, mm. guys, this is not easy when you slot into a formation like this and playing in a different position with players like Chukwese who have to assimilate to you. Same goes for Rafael Leao. You kind of highlighted it at one point in the podcast last week. You weren't saying you were against the number 10 position, but it could be too many cooks in the kitchen, but it provided to be a Michelin star restaurant at that point because Milan could not stop scoring. Um, um, one again, quick thing to add yeah. on to that, Martino, too, that I just want to – um, but I think it's an interesting sort of conversation to have here is, you know, we've talked about his production and the only way you can really produce is one, if you're confident too, but he's health. If you're healthy, he's been very healthy this year. And I know um, I was listening to the the game, you know, while I was doing some things around my, my place and Matteo brought up Matteo Bonetti, of course, on, on, you know, Paramount for those who are not familiar. Um, he brought up a good, he brought up a very good point. I think it was sort of an interview that, came about earlier in the season with Pulisic and, you know, talking about some of the success he had early on and Pulisic, you know, you know, spoke to the fact that, you know, when he was at Chelsea and he was having to come off the bench after prolonged periods of time off, it's tough when you're cold or you're not really in game shape to then have to like match that intensity that the league requires or the type of football and this level of football requires. So he sort of almost was attesting a lot of his injuries and, and, and issues to that those prolonged periods of time off. And it's when you finally get your first opportunity, your legs, everything, your body's just not ready for it. The fact that he's been able to play consistently and get out there and get the legs moving and have that sort of, you know, consistent pitch time, I think has also been a large, you know, reason for why he's been able to stay so fit. And I just find it fascinating, right? Because, you know, for all the injuries we've had this year, right? And for all the question marks that people raise about, you know, our fitness coaches and our facilities and the way we go about, you know, uh, addressing injuries, two injury prone players that come from Chelsea have been the two of the players that have played some of the most minutes yeah, on the she team. Only had that, like injury spell earlier in the season. Uh, right. he had a, but like you're talking about these players that are just what it was. like, yeah. oh, these players are injury prone. They're going to get injured again and knock on wood. But, like idea. We're getting a ton of, ton of minutes and production. We're talking, we're getting not just minutes. We're getting goals. Yes. Sis from Lubin lost his cheek in different roles. Like we're getting so much from two players that people said they're risky signings. And we're getting really significant production from them. So I think that's that always makes it, it very interesting how, you know, players that could come to Milan and this sort of uh, mecca for, for the wrong reasons when it comes to injury dealing with. And yeah. now they're consistently on the pitch and they're consistently producing. Yeah. I, and again, just producing on a consistent level and sort of not put, putting Pioli in a situation in which it's difficult to bench him for a player like Samuel Chukweze, who has finally gotten this consistency of starting now. Um, obviously, the injury earlier in the season, Pulisic's fantastic form, going to AFCON with Nigeria when they lost in the final. This is a player beaming with confidence. Man of the match, in my opinion, because everybody had a goal contribution in this. But who is the most threatening of players? Like The ball-carrying ability in this was great. He looked lively in terms of his work rate as well. There was just so many things that you could see from this complete performance. This guy, when he is on, is so damn good. And the fact that this is the backup to the guy that's one of the signings of the season speaks volumes about this. And I know it might be a little bit late into the year. You would have liked to have seen it earlier considering mm -hmm. Milan are so many points behind Inter at this rate. But the fact remains this. Samuel Chukwese looks like he has arrived at Milan and he is thriving now. His dribbling ability, I think, is just so key because when you have a player like him and Liao on at the same time and it's hard to keep these guys in front of you one-on-one, -on -one, that spells doom and gloom for a lot of Serie A mm -hmm. defenses, let alone what you're going to be getting in, hopefully, the, a deep run into the Champions League next year and so on. For me, I, I have been so happy and thrilled to see this happen for him because it honestly, at this point, the weight of the world came off of his shoulders the second he scored that goal against Verona, man. I mean, mm -hmm. to do it in the Champions League was fine in those two instances, and to get us into Europa League was great. But to see Chukwese do it 
um, in matches like this when they really need something from him with suspension. Because let's be real, Milan had no real options at the number 10. They had to put Pulisic there, especially if they want to continue that 4-2-3-1. You weren't going to put Musa there. Adley wasn't going to go there. Reinders wasn't going to go there. Benacer surely can't even play there at this point. Pobega ain't getting in there regardless if he's recovering from the injury. So to just have that solution, and now Pioli could sit there and say, I fully trust this guy. And he's pretty much said it as well. So to have this happen for Milan in a key stretch of the season, right? Locking up second place is important. Um, hopefully not losing against Inter in the Derby would be great. And we have this fixture against Roma coming up as well. This has just been a real positive in a great start to 2024 for Milan because they've been firing on all cylinders, seven straight victories in Serie A. Your thoughts on Chukweze, your man in the match as well? Yeah, I mean, look, people can look to Pulisic's goal. They can look to Leao's goal. Great pass and assist by Adley on there too, by the way. He deserves his, his praise in this match as well. Um, the amount of passes he attempted and completed, his his game was was very solid in this game. Um and I think that Chukweze, you know, just to see, you know, to your point, him being with confidence after such a difficult bulk of the season. Like, let's be honest, as soon as pe- we, we paid more for Chukweze, people knew that, okay, there was going to be some competition for minutes. And how does Pioli, you know, uh, get both those players to you know, get minutes, but also to get quality minutes where they're producing. And obviously early on, Pulisic took that job and, and never looked back. So it could be difficult and challenging for a player like Chukweze to get mm. that continuity. And of late, he's come on and Pioli's, to his credit, has made it a bit of work, right? You're putting him in positions to succeed. That's a very important thing here. And I think that's also a testament to Chukweze as a player, right? You know, when yes. he comes back from AFCON, he's probably thinking like, how much more, how many more rough minutes? Final to lose. Rough final Rough final. Pulisic is hammering down this right wing role. He's playing really strong. He's getting a lot of the praise and attention. People are criticizing me and they're saying, you know, look, I might be a CDK, a CDK 2.0. Not saying those were his words, but, you know, the yeah. mental component of this game can weigh on your player. And, you know, when, when Chukweze comes in here and he starts to produce and you want to see him play really well down the stretch, it just looks extremely well for him. And it looks well for the future of this attack because, Next year, you know, you're looking at, you know, and probably a new striker. I would be stunned if our big investment doesn't come in that area. And now you're looking across that attack, like more games in the Champions League as well. Yeah. You have the luxury of being able to, you know, hey, hey, Ruben, let's give you a breather. Pulisic can take that job. Or hey, you know, let's 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 switch formations. We can give Chukweze a burn and we don't skip a beat on the right sure. side. You can play him with Leal. Like these yeah. players have proven it's they just, can coexist. Granted. It, I know it's Lecce. I know people are going to say, oh, it's Lecce. You can, only play the, you can only play the opponents in front of you, right? I know Milan have played recently some softer opponents, you know, Empoli's of the world, Lecce's of the world, you know, some of these teams. But let's be honest here. Aside from a couple teams at the top of the table, most of the teams have been very inconsistent this year. So, Absolutely. right. Absolutely. So half the teams or the majority of the teams, a single top player is going to play against Correct. is going to be mediocre to average, right? It's just yeah. a matter of whether or not you produce in those games. And Chukweze has begun to do that with consistent minutes. So kudos to him. And I I, mm-hmm. I agree. I think, you know, Milan gave him their the fan vote MVP and their own MVP. And I think that's pretty fair for this game. He was direct. All the qualities we were hyping up when he came to Milan, we saw them on display this weekend. Yeah, of course. Uh, just Just really happy to see him thriving. And again, Important fixtures ahead with Roma. Um, this guy, Giroud, he's just timeless. Um, this type of goal, and, and we haven't even talked about the other player who provided this assist, by the way, who's arguably also in conversation for man of the match, and that's Yassine mm-hmm. Adley. Um, what a threat from set pieces he is. And to also provide these passes to Giroud as well. Um, the perfect type of performance from him. Doesn't need a full 90 minutes scores on an opportunity that was given to him um in the air really strong fit and you saw the frustration from Lecce too if you if you ever get scored on by Olivier Giroud in that type of fashion that is usually the type of frustration uh Virgil van Dyke has this like very like famous um interview I'm not sure if you've seen it on a player that like has always bothered him or always gotten the best of him and he's just like for whatever reason Olivier Giroud is one of those players that when you think you have him defended well, you don't. And Mm -hmm. that's this type of situation here. This goal was was a great finish with his head. 
And like you mentioned, maybe a handful of matches left for Giroud. The rumors have been they want him to be this third choice striker. Um, LAFC look prime to sign this guy for this coming season, an 18 month contract or so. Um, Giroud again, great production from him. Really happy that he continues to make his mark. The statistics are right here, Matt. 13 goals and 8 assists. We can make of it as we want. Maybe not the most completed performances, but when the guy's 37, we can't argue with 21 goal contributions. You can't. And I think, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I, I would like to believe that 13 goals and 8 assists domestically is up there, if not his best domestic season statistically of his career. You can probably, I might be wrong there, but it's, it has to be close to get those numbers. I know he wasn't this sort of 21, 25 goal scorer at Arsenal. He wasn't that at Chelsea. He had some big moments. He had some key goals. He was pretty solid, consistent with his hold up play. As far as production is concerned, like 13 and eight, I mean, he's like we realist, realistically could see a 15, 10 season from him this year at 37 in a league that is by all accounts could be the toughest to score. And if you, if, if you're buying into the, you know, the words of a Ronaldo who said this league is very difficult and other players who have come to this league and have struggled to score, whereas they scored elsewhere. I mean, it's a testament to the guy's preparation. It's a testament to his ability to know his way around the box and have that, that sense for goal. I think that you can't teach, you know, people will, and that's something I've even like grew to really appreciate and kind of try to understand a little bit more over the years is people say, oh, they're all tappings or all this or all that, or you don't understand header, the sport at that he's level. Different. But yeah. but but they'll use these excuses with a Holland or a Ronaldo and try to kind of like diminish their production. If it's so easy, if getting into the right spaces is so simple, why isn't everybody putting up fifteen to twenty goals a year? And I think it's Far that understanding too. and that intelligence that while his legs might not be there, while he might not be able to run in behind guys, he's the classic striker that in many ways it's almost like a Pipo and Zaghi, where it's like you give him one chance in the box, he's gonna convert. He's going to make something out of it. And I think you're seeing a lot of these goals. I mean, it's nothing sexy, but that's a great header coming across yeah. the face of goal, glancing back, and the goalkeeper doesn't even move. Yeah. That's a difficult header to make. So mm -hmm. a big testament to the year he's had. It goes without saying, despite all the you know, criticisms of, you know, you know, he slows down our play or, you know, he's had you know matches where he scored goals, mm -hmm. but he really didn't do anything else. And he doesn't look as good as his numbers show. 13 and 8. In a, in a role that has been an, an, an eyesore for us to watch over the years, bar obviously Ibrahimovic, you have to really admire and appreciate what he's doing for this club um, these past couple of years. And this year as we're you know trying to make a deep push into uh, Europa League. Yeah, I mean, he's done his job in terms of production. I agree with certain people, and I've even said it myself, you would like to see the full body of work over 90 minutes. But at the end of the day, Milan were the team that signed a guy in his mid his to late thirties. Right yeah, job exactly. Is the that's but that exactly. Let me just say, like, they signed a guy in his mid to late thirties. Like, if you're expecting more than that, then I think that's on you. Um, because at the end of the day, this is just about production. He's been a, a very good penalty taker. Maybe not the greatest, but good enough mm -hmm. because he scores often. Um, and again, just the eight assists too. It's right place, right time, and that's a skill. All right. Anyone who thinks it's the opposite just really never played or has any idea what they're talking about. Um, but again, Rafael Leao scoring in consecutive games. <clears throat> Obviously rounded the goalkeeper, had an assist against Fiorentina. Leao scoring here is just, they were going to win either way. They were in control of this entire game. But my goodness, if we want to also talk about this through ball by Yassin Adli, because I think that was really the story with this. Um, Yassin has really found his footing um, with the club now. Also talks about his extension. And this is coming from a player that was told to find another club by the manager. Um, make of that as you will with Stefano Pioli. But the fact is, there is a newfounded trust there. And this player, in my opinion, is better than any version we saw of Rade Krunic, the guy he effectively stole his job. Um so for me, just to kind of circle back with Rafael Leao, great to see him get a goal here. Still only six on the season. If this is the worst he's going to give us from here on out, I guess we'll take it. Uh, but again, this is just good. It's just building up that confidence. We, we talk about it all the time on the podcast here. I highlight these statistics. The guy always heats up. 
when the weather is going in that direction as well. Um, so again, Leal, consecutive games scored. Uh, just final kind of note on this game, your thoughts on him and Adley, if you want to make a comment there. Yeah, sure. So on um, on Adley, two assists on, on the game. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the amount of passes he completed, efficiency. I mean, this is a player that, you know, yes, we know he has his limitations when it comes defensively in a double pivot. You know, in certain matches, he can get a little bit overshadowed and overmatched because the physical side of him and the defensive side is not there. But you need to have that coverage for him. But when it comes to pass completion, efficiency, accuracy, I mean, he has so good. He's a player that's so come good. on really good this year. And, you know, that, that was a big question coming into the season, right? Once he, once we knew he was going to stay, was it going to be a player that proves his worth and cements a role in the squad? Or is yeah. he going to be a player that, Pioli keeps, but then he winds up moving on loan in January. And a credit to him for staying on and wanting to prove himself. And I think he's a prime example for a lot of young footballers and a lot of other players, young players at bigger clubs that, you know, I'm not playing. I, you know, my their ego and their pride gets the best of them. And sometimes that's fine. You, you know, sometimes transfers don't work. He could have easily jumped ship and went somewhere, you know, in Serie A. There were Serie A clubs that were reportedly interested in him. Yeah, he could have yeah. went back to France. The Learning Tano was one of them, I think. Yeah. This was a player that Milan – if, if people remember, bought a year and a summer early to and snap him up and then kept him at Bordeaux for another season. And there's a reason for that. Like, you don't just get a player a year ahead of you. You have to see, like, okay, in the, in the bigger picture, he's going to be a player that we think can do some do some good things for us. So that for him to have this sort of breakout year, and Martino, as like you were you were talking, I was sort of you know, wanting to pose a, a, a question to you is, is he Milan's most improved player this year? We've we've had a lot of players move into the team. You know, there's a lot of new players that have come in. Pulisic. We're not talking about MVP. We're not yeah, yeah. Well, because it because the improved player has to imply someone who was here the year prior. So yeah. all the best players that have been playing well have been those new signings. Is it yeah, Gabby I mean, maybe? I don't. I, uh, mm, mm. Like, well, I was many players who are playing Gabbia, prominent which, roles for I'll, me. I'll have a thought on Gabia in a second, but to your Adley one. Yeah, because of what Adley was, which was virtually a player that was non-existent yeah. for the majority of a season to being a key player in certain matches, scoring a goal against Roma, which ended up being a, a winning goal in the difference in that one. Um, he had a great performance against Atalanta. He has really had some strong performance. I think he played pretty well in the Europa League. Uh, even when he's gotten the opportunity, I think he played against Dortmund. He did the best that he could. And remember, guys, I think it's very important to highlight this is not a naturalized number six. This is not a player that has experience in this position as a defensive mm -hmm. midfielder. That needs to grow. He's still just 23 years of age. As you mentioned, they bought him when he was 20. They had a loan him back out to Bordeaux, which he played very well, played even great against PSG, which was one of like the main highlighted reasons for that. Whether or not you want to go back and forth with like this sort of Pioli thing with this is a little different. The fact is this. He's arrived now. He's playing well now. And mm -hmm. he's only going to get better. So this is like the thing that I, I constantly say, and, and you know I, I do this, is that when you have a young team, when the average age is of 23, right, are there a lot of finished products? No, not yet. Not necessarily. With the, with the Pulisics and Loftus Cheeks, the more experienced players you expect mm -hmm. the results sort of now, right? And even Noah Okafor to an extent. When you have someone like Adley, Yunus Musa, um, even Alex Jimenez is going to be one of these players as well that, yeah, they're buying them for what they're going to be in three to four years. And I know people kind of get annoyed at this sort of reset of, 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 you know, like when you're changing in 10 different players coming into a team. Mm -hmm. You want results now. You want to screw that, though. Fans want more and more success uh, as soon as possible. But the reality is when you buy players at this age, it takes a while for them to develop. We see Rafael out. Even he has his struggles still with his inconsistencies in scoring, right? You've seen Adley in one of the most difficult, if not probably a top three difficult position on the pitch, orchestrating the tempo of the game and dictating the pace of play a good amount of time is fucking hard, okay? And when you're normally a Metsala, when you're a box-to-box -box midfielder closer to goal, it's hard. So the mm -hmm. fact that he's adjusted like this, yes. My question to you is, though, that I kind of just want to circle back on this. I was thinking on how well Gabia was playing, and he had another solid performance in this game, too. 
And I was really happy to see that because, again, this is just confidence building. Again, whatever the, the opponent's the opponent, but he's played very well against many teams at this point. Where would Milan be if they never loaned out Gabia? Does Gabia get to this level because of that loan? Or maybe if he actually started the season and was given a vote of confidence, he would still be the same player and Milan don't blow or have as difficult of a time in the back end of 2023. Because if you add this Matteo Gabbia next to Tomori for, for that first half of the season, they're not better than Inter or ahead of them mm-hmm. in the standings, but they're sure as hell of a lot closer to them. So I think Gabbia to me is probably the unsung hero of the season. Because he's just completely stabilized the defense until the boys got back. Because that's essentially what's happened. Yeah, it's it, it, the context matters in here. In this case, you know, when you look at departmentally, where we were at in the midfield versus defense, we weren't as thin in the midfield as we were in the defense. Central mm-hmm. defense specifically. I mean, you know, the fact that we're even still thin at left back, right? Like having to take, having to take your primary left back who's – world class and arguably the best in the world of football and move him into a central defensive role that says a lot right the fact that we're having to play Bartasagi and, and Florenzi as left back like Milan's you know defensive concern was I mean Milan in second place despite all those injuries so like you could almost see that like you know yes are Milan in second despite Pioli or because of some of the management he's been able to do and getting a Gabia to play to this level to get an Adley. Like I get that people have maybe their own, own feelings and agendas towards Pioli and, yeah. you know, maybe some of the, the injuries are, are self-inflicted, right? You know, how you handle and rotate players over, you know, overstretching um, you know, players in certain matches when they should have maybe come off earlier. Like we've seen it. Right. But in his defense, you get Gabia back and you're able to put him in and by almost by force, to play well he's got to be doing something from a coaching standpoint and he asked these players have to be buying in somewhere to play to this level so there was conversations though he lost the changing room and, and you you've heard at every turn that the players back pioli so whatever the criticisms we have of how he coaches certain games and how he you know approaches the games against inter and the champions league whatever the case may be the fact is, is that we've seen him this time this year with a lot of players, or at least a handful of players that are young, get them to produce. Gabby is pretty young, 24, right? 24 For a defender, old. yeah, absolutely. For a defender, yeah. right? Getting Adley to play into a role and to have confidence to play almost by force, but also, hey, like, all right, was, I see the play. It was a gun to his, his head. <laughs> right, yeah. right, yeah. but still. So, like, yeah, you're right, you're right. You know, like, you have to kind of look at it everything. Like, I think, like, we this isn't a Pioli hate podcast. People people are gonna no, we never we never we talked about what we thought about the potential, you know, him staying on right in our previous one. You guys can check that out. Yeah, we never asked for a sack in the middle of the season. But we never at the that. same time, I think like if you're having the conversation, like and you want to be fair with the conversation, approach it from all angles. Has Pioli well, yeah, of course, the, 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 the sport just, in these situations have so much nuance. It's, let me just let me just say this: Has he done everything right this year? No. We, we still get slapped around by Inter. The Champions League was a disappointment. How he's managed some of these injuries and, and usage has been questioned quite a bit. But has he done some good things with this team this year and helping develop players and having players grow? I think he has a little bit to an extent. Like yeah. you, you can't not say it. I mean, getting it's not easy also getting a bunch of brand new midfielders and getting them to play pretty well. He switched formations up in the middle of the season as well. He went back to the 4-2-3-1. They right. were – Starting at a four three three, I think I think he's done solid. Um, but again, I think for some Pioli backers, they only look at twenty twenty four, which is not fair. Yeah. We judge we judge people on a full season. So same thing with like everyone else within this team. Like great, great for Rafa, great twenty twenty four, right? But we can't have you going missing goal scoring wise in Serie A for that long. Yeah. As much as I love the player, you, it just can't happen. This is Milan. You, the standards are high. Inter are getting their 20th league title. And Milan are double-digit points back. That's the reality. Despite, despite having a really great 2024 so far. So, yeah, you know, it, it, exactly. It, it's yeah. It's been a hell of a turnaround, but it's not even close to being good enough. That's the bar. That's the standard. Um, preview versus Roma. We'll keep this short and sweet. Um, 
We'll try and fix something with Wayne, uh, Matt. I'll tell you it's just an update about it after the show. But but the fact is this: Milan play Roma. Roma have not beaten Milan in nine straight matches within Serie A. Uh, Pre-COVID was the last time Roma beat Milan. Again, Milan had the advantage here. Roma played well enough to beat Lazio one nil in a very difficult derby game. So kudos to them. They're really vying for that fifth or fourth spot. Uh, Bologna dropped two points against Frosinone, so kudos to them. De Rossi has really turned them around. They played fantastic against Inter, uh, even though they lost 4-2. to two. It's just about their overall vibe, morale. Um, Lu- uh, Lorenzo Pellegrini looks like a completely different player mm. and, and back to the player that I really adored um, and with his technical ability. Tammy Abraham just came back from injury, so good for him. Um, really happy to see him back on the pitch because he was really solid for Roma prior to that torn ACL. Um, for me, now with this, I hate when we always have leg one at home. It is so annoying. But, like, I don't know why we can't switch it up. This is three straight rounds of this. Like, please, like, you wait for this. It's just stupid. But that's besides the point, right? Milan should be able to advance with this. This is not going to be easy. We say this time and time again. This is a different Roma that we have not seen. The odds are reflecting that. Milan are minus 155 to advance to the next round. Yes, this is a part of my job, so I'm going to mention it. Um, With that, your confidence level on a scale of 1 to 10, I'm going to put myself at like a 6 and a half, 7. 6 and a half, 7, I want to say. Um. Yeah, I'll probably say six and a half, seven is probably where I'd probably put it. I mean, I think, look, you know, Roma played due to a draw against Lecce the, the prior They got outplayed weekend. badly. Um, Lecce outplayed them, but Roma bounced back and Roma were able to get a win on the weekend against Lazio, as you just mentioned. So they're riding that confidence, right? That's a big derby win. That's going to galvanize the guys quite a bit. That's a huge push or huge boost. Yeah, man. to their push for top four, top five. So it they're really riding is, some pretty good man. confidence. And I think that, you know, Milan can't, you know, you know, maybe latch on too much and fans can't latch on too much to the successes that we've had recently against Roma. Correct. You have to kind of take them as one game off. And the way this Roma has been playing under Daniel De Rossi has been much better than the Roma we saw earlier in this year under Jose Mourinho. So it's going to take a still a strong performance from Milan. You know, mm. it's not like we had a full week off, right? We're still having to kind of get back into shape, get back into pace. And there is that familiarity with Roma, right? You're going to be playing them after end of these two matches four times this year. So it's not easy to win four matches. Milan don't need to win four matches. Unless you're in there against Milan, though. They just need to get the aggregate advantage. So I think they'll do that. I think this game actually – feel that Milan will play pretty well, but I think that Roma are also going to get out for this. They're not scared, yeah. I feel like it's going to be a 1-1 game, and then I think Milan are going to get it done away, gritty, and they're going to get the job done, and they're going to progress. I think it'll be a 2-0 win for Milan. Wouldn't be shocked if Roma score. Um, For for me, how is Roma going to stop Milan's attack? Seriously, like with the way Milan are playing right now, it's going to be really difficult for them. And again, we talk about priorities here. Bologna dropping points. Juve teetering on, are we okay? Are we not okay? I think Juve will be okay. But the fact remains this. Roma have a couple of options here. It is put forth everything into the league because the league is still very difficult schedule-wise. And again, Facing Milan within within between those games is no easy feat for them. Uh, Milan also have Sassuolo after this game in between uh, the two with Roma. So they're also not in the easiest of spots, but Milan far more advantageous in, sort, in terms of uh, locking up a top spot for next year's Champions League. It, it looks more than likely that they're going to do so. Yeah. So with that, for me, I think Roma will put in a good fight. It really just comes down to how many minutes and quality minutes does Paolo Dybala and Romelu Lukaku give Roma. And the answer for me is probably not going to be that many. Um, and especially with what's happening on the weekend, like De Rossi is going to have a lot on his hands, in his hands on how to prioritize. It was great when they smacked Brighton at home um, and they didn't really have to worry about that second leg as much, right? Because they built up such a great lead. What do they do when they have to go to San Siro for the first leg? and say Milan get a two- to three-goal advantage on them. 
that'll be difficult in telling on what's going to happen at the Olympico, which is not going to be easy. None of this is going to be easy. I'm, we'll make that clear. Um, but again, for me, I think, I think Milan should be in the driver's seat to get this one. Um, and so to finish this off, rumors of Giorgio Scalvini and Milan. Um, this pertains to an article that Sempre Milan had posted today. We'll put the link in the description. Um, Exclusive this, article, by the way. This is, yeah, and subscribe to their sub stack so you get access to this. Basically along the lines of this is what happens. CDK and Atalanta obviously have this sort of uh, deal on the table for him to go and stay at the club permanently. Um, but Milan are interested in Scalvini. Scalvini, I would say one of the hotter young prospect names in, in, in the past mm. couple of years in Italy, for sure, especially defensively. Ford, definitely. Um, def def defensively, absolutely. Calafiori and, and Buongiorno more so this season have emerged ahead of him, I would say. Scalvini is very inconsistent as a player. But the profile to me is so fascinating. So young, playing well. Listen. You play well at a club like Atalanta. It's not just this sort of like, oh yeah, you're young and like they're they're inflating the price. You don't play in a team like that that's pretty good and respectable and facing Liverpool in the Europa League uh, quarterfinals right now, right? Without being somewhat talented. There is talent there. He's been very young. I still think he's only 21 at this point. Yeah. So for me, I, I would I would like to to have a talent like this. But it sounds like it's going to be CDK costing around 20 to 25 million, and then some more cash going Atalanta's way to potentially sign this player. My question to you is, Matt, should Milan sign Scalvin? If we're talking about maybe 32 to 33 million, it's steep. Um, and you have a little bit of pause because you know that certain players typically tend to thrive at Atalanta under Gasparini and they go to other clubs and maybe they're not the same player. So there is a little bit of like that kind of concern. Like what's the catch here? Are Milan going to get a bad deal? I don't know. I mean, we, we talked Mattia Caldara, right? I know that was a swap with Juventus, but this was also sure. a player that was at Atalanta was a force in defense, you know, was a player that scored a lot of headed goals for Atalanta when he was there. So yeah. I know it's a different case. I get that, but you know, Milan do need to get a central defender. They, they tossed around, not even tossed around. It was more than just an idea for Buongiorno in January. Price was mm -hmm. too steep. Some of the reports still suggest that they might go back in for him. The reports that are suggesting that aren't the most reliable. Um, so I think that Milan still have an interest to bolster the central defense. And I think my view, and this is just something that I feel that could potentially come into play, is if Milan are able to package CDK, who has, I believe, an option yeah atalanta have an option to buy it's not an obligation for cdk um you can give you can give cdk and some cash for scavini that's a pretty solid move and would that outlay cost you more or less with buongiorno right i mean i think you're, you're dealing with urbano cairo who probably wants four, upwards of 40. there's reports that maybe bremer he's probably, has he's probably gonna head He's so, like, the there's a lot of other things that kind of come into play where maybe Juventus move in for some of these players. You know, there's there's so many different things that are up in the air when it comes to this area. But my point is, is it's very difficult to acquire good, young, central defensive talent. You're going to have to probably pay up for it. Um, but I think that Milan could be in a position where if they part ways with CDK and they put a little cash in, they can get Scalfini, who, look, Maybe that means one of Malik Chao or Kalulu were sold because I think if you're going to get Scalvini and you're going to spend around 30 million, 30 plus million, it's I'd like to believe it's not going to be as a third or fourth choice central defender. And based on where Milan's depth chart looks like, it's Fikayo and then everyone else is kind of mixed in in that sort of conversation. So if you're going to spend what they would potentially spend to get Scalvini, it's going to be because you're it, it, you're imagining him being a starter at your club, which makes one of maybe Mala Chow or Kalulu expendable in this conversation. Would you agree or would you disagree? I mean, I mean, of course. I, I don't think there's a guarantee. We have to remember Simon Kier is also on his way out of the club. Um, and here's the thing. 
I don't really know how he would fit in this position, but but it's been strongly suggested by quite a few people that he is a regista, a defensive midfielder type that could be converted into that. As far as I know, I don't see Milan doing that. Um, it would be a very difficult transition for him. For me, I just for the club, I just don't want to do a move that is, is too risky like this. I think there is potential huge upside, right? Again, this isn't someone that we're going to be able to plug in and play, in my opinion, immediately and have that sort of impact. I'd be very surprised if Scalvini is a starter day one at Milan. And I know when you pay that sort of money, you're kind of expecting that, right? Yeah. Um, or at least at some point. But to me, it's sort of like, might as well get Calafiori or Buongiorno. I know Buongiorno has that price range, and I understand this is because of CDK. And maybe they've reworked the CDK deal, remove a resale percentage for Atalanta. Maybe that's more enticing for them. But for me, I just I think there's too much risk presented with this move. And as much as I like the player... I don't think Milan is in a position to take more risks. I've said this summer should be about solidified, proven talent. I want more of the Pulisic, Loftus, Cheek type deals. I don't want more of this, hey, you know, maybe this guy will be proven to be somebody one day. But we're also paying up 40-ish. You're you know? talking with the exception being the striker, right? Like uh, you said, you don't want these big risk moves or like these high end. You I mean, want listen, more of like it, a, it, uh, well, the striker position is just totally different in general, right? Because you can't. I'm talking can't, in terms of price tag, like. No, no, no. I know, but uh, let me get to my point. Is like, yeah. if you if you are getting a proven striker, the guy is going to cost you what 60, 70, 80 million, right? Yeah. Like that's that's unfortunately the reality of it. With with these positions, you could find diamonds in the rough that are. That yeah, are I'm not asking. quoted for that. Like, you know, like a, a striker who is so good that everyone covets is known, right? Like, it's not a hidden gem. You might get your Rateggis, right? You're, but everybody knows Xerxes. Everyone knows Gerkis. Jonathan David, again, this is why I think they're going to circle back to that. Because what happens this week? We see the links with Xerxes, man. The quotes are now getting up to upwards of $60 million. I'm not paying $60 million for Xerxes. The guy doesn't score enough to be worth that. As much as I like him as a player, that's not what this club needs. Mm -hmm. So for me, I I think this is too high of a risk. Uh, but again, I, I would have to trust management with this because if they really truly believe that this is the type of player that can evolve to that and he gets hyped and he gets this sort of respect for that. But every time I watch him, there's too many inconsistencies. And I know that comes with being a young defender. But when you pay up that money, I want to see less of the inconsistency. That's that's so my you, so I don't I don't know how you feel. Prefer, so you prefer Buongiorno over Scalvini then? I would I think Buongiorno is more price, price. regardless but, of the, the yeah, price yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Oh, if it's price, well, well, if it's without price, yeah, Buongiorno. Yeah. I, I think both of them are young defenders, and both many people envision playing roles for the Italian national team too. But Scalvini is twenty-one, maybe pushing twenty-two. So he is a couple years younger than Buongiorno. Well he's gonna be Buongiorno. twenty-one in December. Yeah. He's young. So I know, like, I know. it's like, he's I, six I, four. He's a big kid. It's but you you know how I am at this point. I, yeah. I just want I want more proven. And and yeah. and listen, I, I've said I was saying it like he is kind of proven. He's playing at a good club. Yeah. They are in Europe. He is a, a regular for them. But there's just these ups and downs. And again, maybe I'm being too harsh because he's just 20, but more time maybe. It's just I, 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 I'm worried about it. I'm just worried about that type of move. But again, they also vie for this because you said it yourself. If Cairo's quoting all this money, then why are you actually putting yourself into this position where you know they like CDK and you have some cash? In general, the deal will be cheaper for you. It's just, it's so. almost identical, not identical in, in in terms of cost, but in many ways, what's being reported with Xerxes. It's like you could throw in a player, Alexis Salamakers plus cash, and drive that price down. So it's like there's relationships to get a deal done. And look, this is my final thing on it. If you're talking about sure. Buongiorno, Milan tried to get Belotti for you know years and years ago. They offered 
this is when Belotti had his, I think, his 70, 26, like 27 70 whole season. Plus Neon, yeah. He hasn't sniffed anything close to that since, right? Um, Milan tried to get a deal done. They were offering a ton. And people know that dealing with Urbana Cairo is not the easiest. So, like, they're probably thinking, all right, you know what? Like, we value this player at 35, 30 million. If we can't get that deal done, we're not going to get the deal done. We're going to move on. I think that's what this management has showed. And that's what we even showed under Maldini to an extent. You know, when we had Maldini and Mazzara and previous owners or previous management, they're 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 not going to get to, an, to a bidding war. They're not going to say at 45. For the, the reason why Milan were able to get CDK is because the player's will was to go to Milan, not other clubs. Please. So Milan were really just competing Milan and versus it themselves. Leeds. Yeah. <laughs> so that's just kind of my part of it. But I think that, you know, look, you can convince me on Scalvini because I think the conversation's a little bit different than it was, you know, a couple of years ago. This is a, this is Milan's becoming a club or it has become a club that young players right. can thrive in. You know, there isn't that sort of pause and, and skepticism where it's like, is this the right coach? Is this the right environment for a young player to grow? And there was a lot more questions a couple of years ago, but I think you're starting to see like a move, the Musas, the Adleys, even like some of the players that are being forced to get minutes and to get reputable minutes are having some success. So I think that kind of gives me a little bit more confidence in a, in a move for Scalvini, despite his peaks and valleys. If you can get a player that, you know, many envision as a player that can make a role or make a, a push into the Thai national team over the next couple of years, that's appealing in a sense in an area where Milan still, the fact of the matter is they still need to address in some capacity. Yeah. I don't know. It's something it's interesting though, but I think again, a, a, just a quick shout out to Sempre Milan for the exclusive, because you know, that's this uh, was their report. We yeah, should this report. make note. This is, and again, this yeah. is their report. This isn't an aggregated news. Yeah, this yeah. is from their sources. Um, so again, I mean, listen, it, I think it's exciting anyways. Right, like wor worst case, we're talking about one of the hottest young prospects. I, I, I just hope it works out. There's a lot of risk involved, uh, and he's he's great with the ball at his feet, which is something that Milan do need at the center back position. I should say that as well. Um, but yeah, that'll pretty much do it for this podcast. Keep uh, on the lookout on social media for what Matt and I will be doing uh, this coming week in terms of recording and other stuff like that. I will be home for the match against Roma, so. We will be doing a post-match uh, there live. Come and join us if you're able to. Uh, we'll see if Matt might be able to hang out. Who knows? Um, but, yeah, we appreciate all the support. Follow Matt on Twitter at Matt underscore Santangelo and the account that he runs with his brother at AC Milan Bros. Go follow Semper Milan. SemperMilan.com um, is all the news and information that you need in English about Milan. Uh, and, again, just follow me at Martino Puccio and at Martino underscore Puccio on Instagram as well. Uh, all the content on there. And, again, subscribe to the podcast at Milan Pod. Um, pretty much uh, on Apple and Spotify these days. So, again, we appreciate all you audio listeners there who pretty much listen for the entire time. Any final comments from you before we sign off? Uh, no. Just, again, always sign off with a thank you to the – community that supports us we appreciate it and uh yeah as martina mentioned be on the lookout for some uh some updates on what we're going to be doing uh this coming week for uh the big game against uh roma yep all right guys take care